Hi guys, it's Professor Daniel here and I am here with your very first lecture of History 1301. So this chapter or this lecture is going to be over chapter one in your Give Me Liberty textbook and it's titled A New World. So let's get into it. But before I get into it, a little bit of housekeeping so you guys can follow along. If you are wanting to take notes or if you want to look at the lecture that I'm referring to, it is titled Chapter One. It's a PowerPoint and is already attached to module one in your online learning platform. So I'll give you a moment to go ahead and pull that up or to get a pencil and a pen um, and a notepad together while I sip some water. And as always, feel free to pause me anytime. I won't know I'm paused. So don't feel guilty for pausing me if you have to. I know you can't take all of this like historical excitement here, right? Okay, so let's get started. So chapter one of your text is titled The New World. And the first thing I want you guys to really think about is that the new world was not new. So when your book refers to the new world it is referring to the Americas, North and South America. So the new world is not new. In fact, there are more than 10 million inhabitants uh, in the new world already before there is any pre, you know, before there's any European contact in the new world, approximately 7.7 .7 million Africans will be transported via the Middle Passage with the transatlantic slave trade. But we'll talk about that in a later chapter. Um, in the new world, there will be a system of indentured servitude, especially in North America. There will be a system of indentured servitude that will pretty quickly transform into an economic system that is based on plantation slavery. Okay. Um, now, in later chapters, we'll talk about one, what is an indentured servant? Two, why would anyone volunteer to be an indentured servant? And three, what makes them different from slaves? So don't worry if you have those questions now. We will answer all of those questions in great detail in further chapters, okay? So moving forward. So when I say the new world isn't new, um, I want to give you some examples to show that the new world was not new. So first, the first Americans who lived in this area settled the Americas between 15,000 and 60,000 years ago. So it's not new. There have always been people who have lived here, who have their own cultures, traditions, ways of making money, ways of living, right? So some examples of some of these new world societies include Tenochtitlan in present day Mexico, that was an Aztec empire. And then we also have the Incas who were in present or were, excuse me, in present day Peru. These were large, uh, sprawling and technologically advanced societies that were running and very successful thousands of years prior to European contact. So the new world was in no way new. Because we tend to study or because history traditionally has been studied from a Eurocentric uh, point of view, we call it the new world because it was new to Europeans. Um, also, we call it the new world because there was no contact between the old world, aka Europe, Asia, Africa, they were shut off from the rest of the world. So luckily, I just so happen to have a map. Thank you, Deidre Mathis, for buying this map. Um, so if you look at Europe, Europe and Africa, for example, are actually pretty close to each other. So you have these European countries who had established trade with Africa and the East for really centuries. However, they had not crossed the Atlantic. And so there has been absolutely no European contact on this side of the world, which is why we call it the New World. On this side, however, they had developed trade routes. Uh, there had been lots of trading. They were not isolated. They had had contact with different societies. And so because of that, we'll have all sorts of outcomes. And I can't wait to get to that part of the lecture. Okay. 
So <laughs> moving on, I will break out that map, I'm sure, at um, a later time, probably in this lecture, okay? All right, so moving forward. One thing that I want you guys to do, read your text is very important. No, matter of fact, it is imperative that you read your textbook because your book has a lot of information that I may or may not cover in the lecture and your quiz is going to actually have a number of questions that come from the textbook. Yes, some of them will come from the lecture, but others will come from the text. So please make sure you read the text. So in North America, we have the indigenous Native Americans of the Southeast from the Gulf of Mexico all the way to present day Canada. Uh, the diet of Native Americans will vary by region. So if you live near the coast, your diet and um, really your diet and economics uh sustainability is probably going to be based on fishing because that is what you have. That is your resource. That's what you're near. Um, others will eat corn and beans and squash where they are going to be more uh, agricultural. So they're going to grow their food. Others may hunt and gather. But one thing that I want you guys to really know is that whether you're talking about the indigenous of the Southeast or the Hopi and Zuni of the West, Every Native American culture is incredibly diverse. Not only is it diverse, I'll say this, and it's very important that you guys get this. It is not a monolith. You cannot look to one Native American tribe or the experience of one group of Native American peoples and group it all together because they're not a monolith. It's not one experience and one story for this very rich and very culturally diverse uh, people. So they are not a monolith, okay? So I've also included a map uh, on slide five of this chapter. So in this map, I included it because A, I love that it's very easy to read and it's color, uh, color coordinated based on the primary uh, economic activity of the tribes that were uh, or that existed in North America prior to European contact. So it's color coordinated based on agriculture, um, hunting, hunter gathering um, and fishing and so you can look at this and you'll see that uh, what the diet and what the economic activity it's all based on their region so it's very important or very interesting rather I'd say to look at that so in one of the questions that I'll ask you guys later in some of your assignments is what contributed or what were some of the um, contributing factors to the culture clash between indigenous peoples of North and South America and Europeans who will come to the Americas? So one, first we need to know uh, why are Europeans coming to America? What Europeans are coming to America? What will they do? And what will the impact be? And so these are all things that we'll discuss in this chapter. So the first group group of Europeans that we will discuss in this chapter will be the Spanish that is coming from Spain. Now, um, one thing that I want you guys to really learn and understand is that, and I might have said it in another video in a previous video, is understand that we speak the language of our colonizers, okay? I'll repeat that. We speak the language of our colonizers. Okay, so America or much of North America was or yeah, much of North America, that's accurate, was colonized by the English. So we speak English. A lot of Central and South America was colonized by the Spanish. So they speak Spanish. There is a South American country that was not colonized by the Spanish. Instead, it was colonized by the Portuguese. And so they speak Portuguese. What is that society? I'll give you like five seconds. What country in South America was not colonized by the Spanish. That country is Brazil. So you'll notice that in Brazil, they speak 
Portuguese. It's because Brazil was colonized by the Portuguese. So we speak the language of our colonizers. So in this first chapter, we will speak about other um, European countries, but we'll mostly talk about the Spanish. Okay. So when the Spanish come, they are looking for wealth, they are looking uh, well for wealth in the form of gold and they are looking for glory. OK, they are looking for wealth, gold and glory. Um, they're also looking to spread Christianity. OK, and their Christianity at this time is Catholicism. So this is one of the first elements of a culture clash that they will have. So, of course, when the Spanish come, being Christian, they are monotheistic. Monotheistic means one God, meaning you worship one God. Mono meaning one. Na many Native American cultures and tribes and nations are polytheistic. Poly meaning many. So they worship many gods. So that's one culture clash is that of religion. Um, the Spanish will force conversion um, to Native Americans at this time. And so, yeah, that first culture clash, I would say, is religion. That is the first, I would say, major difference. Another difference is the idea of property or land ownership. Native Americans have a different value system when it comes to the idea of land ownership. There's this idea of public versus privately owned uh, land. So for many Native American cultures, the land was not something that someone owned individually. Um, you may be able to use a portion of the land for a season so you can grow crops for a season, but it wasn't yours. In Native American culture, the land was something that was communal. It belonged to everyone. It was there before them and it would be there after them. So land was not something they felt that could be individually owned. It was something that belonged to everyone in the group. It was a very communal um, society. However, Europeans, it's much more, the culture is much more, um, individualistic. It's about what you own. So when they come and they take this land, not only will they take the land, they will even erect symbols that show that this is no longer yours. This is now mine. So we even still use these uh, these symbols for in today's society, fences. Europeans will come and will erect fences, for example, to show this is my plot of land. It does not belong to you. You are to stay away. Everything that is in here is mine. It is not communal. It is for me. It is individualistic. So that's another way, uh, or that is another difference between European society and Native American society that is present in the New World at this time. Another pretty big difference would be with gender relations. So, one, you have one society that is a bit more egalitarian and you have one that is largely patriarchal. So in Native American society and some of these nations, women could have premarital sex. There was nothing that said that you have to remain pure and chaste until marriage. Also, many Native American uh, societies were matrilineal. Now, don't get matrilineal confused with matriarchal. It was not matriarchal. It is matrilineal, meaning that the kinship lines, the kinship ties follow the mother's line. So to further explain this, the way that I explain this to my classes is that we live in a more patrilineal society, right? So when a man and woman are married, the woman symbolically leaves her family to become part of the husband's family. And you're probably wondering, how do we symbolically do this? Well, for one, when a man and woman get married, traditionally, the woman gives up her last name and she takes her husband's last name. That's hugely symbolic. That is saying that you are no longer a part of this family unit. You are part of the husband's family unit. So uh, opposite, 
really happened in Native American society. Kinship ties followed that of the woman instead of the man. Um, so there were huge differences uh, as far as gender relations and dress and how women should behave. Um, there were huge differences there. Europeans also had a number of stereotypes that they uh, began as soon as they really set foot on uh, New World turf, you could say. They viewed Native Americans as being uncivilized, as being brutes, as being too free because they don't have Christian liberty. Uh, so they see them as being too free. Um, I'm going to back up a little bit and go back up to gender relations because this is something I really want you guys to have in your notes. Not only could women engage in premarital sex, they could also divorce their husbands. So it gives women, um, it puts women not necessarily on an equal playing field, but it allows women to have more of a voice and more of a choice in the society. So these are some of the differences between Native American society and European society that will be present at the very beginning. Okay. So one thing that I always ask my students is how many of you guys heard the rhyme referring to Christopher Columbus, where it's like Christopher Columbus felt the ocean blue in 1492 or something like that. I remember first hearing about this in elementary school. Um, however, they never really taught me a lot about Christopher Columbus, why he was selling the ocean blue, and why it's actually inappropriate to have a Columbus Day in America because he actually never set foot here. So where you are sitting right now, if you are in present day United States of America, he never set foot there, right? But we still celebrate Columbus Day. So let's demystify this Christopher Columbus character and see what he's doing, uh, why he's sailing, and all the things that you were probably taught that are actually wrong. Okay, so one, Christopher Columbus is Italian. He is an Italian um, explorer. And even though he is Italian, he is not fly or not flying, I'm sorry. He is not sailing for Italy. He ends up gaining sponsorship from the king and queen of Spain. So King Ferdinand of Spain and Queen Isabella of Spain. He gains sponsorship because again, Spain is looking for wealth, gold, and glory. And so if he sails for Spain and he finds some wealth, they will continue to sponsor him. So though he was Italian, he did sail for Spain. His goal was to develop trade with the East. Now, Christopher Columbus knew the earth was round, so we don't believe the hype. He knew, and by this time, most people knew that the earth was not flat, right? We have discovered that already. So while Christopher Columbus knew the earth was round, he vastly underestimated the size. He also underestimated this big, huge landmass here known as like North and South, or dare I say really Central America, because Central America is where he ends up um, landing. So he doesn't actually get to North America. He does get to Central America though. So Christopher Columbus is planning on sailing from Spain, which is this pink country right here. And he is trying to develop trade with the East. Now, knowing that the world, you know, that the earth is round, if you sail out from here, he is hoping that eventually he will make it to the East. However, he runs into the landmass known as Central America and the rest is history. So Christopher Columbus, again, never actually makes it to America. He makes it more or less to like um, his family. He makes it to the islands, to the Indies, is what we call them today, but he does not make it to North America. All right. 
So we do get a very important phrase from, um, from him, a very important term known as the Columbian Exchange. So the Columbian Exchange is defined as the broad exchange of food, livestock, germs, and etc. between the old and new worlds. So again, earlier in the chapter, or earlier in the lecture rather, I talked about how the Americas were relatively isolated. They had not had contact from anyone over here. Now, if you lived in Africa at the time, you've had contact with Europeans because of trade. If you lived in other places over here at the time, every other European country, you have had contact with other people because of trade routes that had been developed centuries before. However, People who were living in North, Central, and South America had not had any contact with people, which helps to explain the massive, I, dare I say, extermination of Native Americans in North, Central, and South America. But before we talk about germs, let's talk about foods that come from the old world to the new world. So from Europe, Africa, and Asia, the Americas get, for example, the coffee bean. I started my uh, my day today with some coffee, and we got that from the old world. Peaches and pears, for example. Um, olives, grapes. So for those of you who like to have a little bit of wine at the end of the day, you can thank that or thank the old Old world for that because you need grapes to make wine and grapes come from the old world. We also get livestock from the old world. So uh, cattle, sheep, pigs, horses, all of these things come from the old world as um, as well as sugarcane, the honeybee, uh, grains such as wheat, rice, and barley. All of these things come from the old world. Uh, one of the biggest things I would say that come from the old or comes from the old world, however, are diseases. So smallpox, influenza, aka the flu, typhus, uh, the measles. Uh, what else do we have here? Malaria, diphtheria, pertussis, aka whooping cough. So if you lived um, over here, let's say you live in North Africa, you've had contact with Europeans. So these diseases aren't going to be as devastating because you have built up an immunity, because you have had exposure to these people and their germs and all of the diseases that come from these germs. However, in the new world, they don't have any uh, immunity because they have not had any contact. So that is going to be devastating to the Native American or indigenous populations of North, Central, and South America. So it's not just the new world that is getting things from the old, however. The old world gets a number of things from the new world. So one, for example, is tobacco. So tobacco, as we start to talk about uh, the development of English America, tobacco will be Virginia's, what we'll call their substitute for gold. They're not able to find gold and they need to make money for their mother country. And so their substitute for gold will be tobacco. Uh, we also, the old world will also get the pumpkin. They'll get the turkey. Uh, that's something that we all tend to partake in at least uh, once a year. They'll get uh, cassava, potatoes, especially in South America. They have so many different varieties of the potato and they are known for having uh, just hundreds of different varieties of potato. They'll also get corn, cassava, vanilla, the avocado, all of these things uh, are some things that the old world will get from the new. So in slide number nine in the PowerPoint, you will have a picture of the uh, Columbian exchange and it will help you to understand some things that the old and new world got from each other. However, once there is contact between the indigenous populations of the Americas and Europeans, unfortunately, the indigenous Indigenous population will decline. It will greatly suffer because of one, 
wars and they don't have the firepower to or the I would say the technology to fight the Europeans effectively or to at least to at least put them on an even playing field. There will also be a large or a high amount, a high degree of enslavement of slavery. Uh, the Spanish especially will force the native population to work for them, to they will enslave them and have them work in gold mines. Um, and of course, a large amount of the indigenous population will decline due to disease. Some of these diseases in, um, include, but are not limited to, uh, influenza, smallpox, diphtheria, typhus, all of those heebie-jeebies the Europeans bring and there is no immunity and so they will suffer and die due to these diseases. So the Spanish are some of the first to come and capitalize off of the new world. So government in Spanish America is absolute, meaning that any appointee, any official is from Spain. They have been appointed by the Spanish crown. So even though they are in America, they are still governing as if they are in Spain. And so they make themselves leaders and they will rule these areas. The Catholic Church is highly highly involved in this colonization effort. Their goal is to convert and by conversion, thereby civilize uh, Native American populations. So they want to convert them from their native religions to Catholicism. And the hope is that by giving them something that they do, because Europeans see themselves as civilized, and so they feel that Native Americans have to bring themselves up to their civilization, all right? So they view Native Americans as being lower. And so they have to build themselves up to civilization. And so the way that they're supposed to do this is via conversion. Conversion is supposed to civilize them. Indigenous people were enslaved and they were forced to work in gold and silver mines. And of course, they're not paid for it. They don't get to keep any of this gold and silver that they are mining. Um, Native Americans, while they will outnumber Europeans in Spanish America, um, they will not have, it's not equal in any way. So a lot of them are dying. A lot of them are sickly. A lot of them will die of starvation. So one of your um, assignments, one of your readings was from Voices of Freedom and it's number three, Bartolome de las Casas. I'll go into that in a bit more detail as we get to that slide. Um, because there's a lot of mixing, we get another racial categorization. So one thing that I find really interesting when we're talking about European colonization is the concept of race. We really, I would say it's not, it's Europeans, I will say, who will um, come up with these different categorizations of for, uh, for race. And it begins very early. It begins even in the beginnings of Spanish America in the 1500s. So in the 1500s, because you have uh, Europeans, aka the Spanish, who are coming from Spain, to the new world, you will end up getting mixing, you'll end up getting a miscegenation. And so the offspring of these mixed race or biracial couples will be uh, called mestizos. So mestizos are persons of mixed ancestral origin. So your book will uh, talk about some of these categorizations. So read about those categorizations. Okay. Now, the Portuguese, it's not just the Spanish, though the Spanish will do a lot. Let's be frank. The Spanish will take the lead. Uh, but it would be unfair to not talk about the Portuguese. Now, I really like talking about the Portuguese because they are the ones who will accelerate the slave trade. Okay, so with the Portuguese, they will establish the world's first sugar economy that is worked 
uh, by enslaved Africans. So because I'm recording this and not doing like a Zoom, I can't show you my screen, but hopefully you're looking over this. So if you are not in my class, but you're just watching this, if you look at a map of Africa, you will see off of the western coast of Africa, there is a small island known as Sao Tome. It is spelled S-A-O and then T-O-M-E, Sao Tome. And you'll notice that, hmm, Sao Tome, it's an African island, but this doesn't sound like an African word. Hmm, Sao Tome, Sao Tome. What does that sound like? Ah, it sounds Portuguese because it is Portuguese. The Portuguese were really good in that they used the Mediterranean Atlantic as their training ground, as their seafaring trading ground. So again, I told you earlier that Europeans were not separated from Africa. They were not... Um, isolated from Africa. And they used the Mediterranean Atlantic as a training ground. They knew that, yes, we want to do some sea exploration, but we need to practice. And so they used the Mediterranean um, Atlantic as this training ground to use the currents. So if we go, uh, if we go west, we have to be able to catch the currents and come back east. So they use that. So the Portuguese, I said, definitely uh, will accelerate the slave trade. They will accelerate the idea of using Africans to work um, to work plantations. So in Sao Tome, they use African slaves to produce sugarcane. So this will become the first sugar economy to be worked by enslaved Africans. So Sao Tome is something that is. Um, very important, or I would say significant to study because it is the world's first sugar economy to be worked by enslaved Africans. And again, this is back in the 1500s. So in spreading Catholicism, it's very, it's really almost like a deal that happens. Okay. So in 1493, um, Pope Alexander VI decides to divide the Christian world, uh, or I'm sorry, to divide the non-Christian world between Spain and Portugal. So he essentially says, Portugal, you get Brazil. And Spain, you get to have everything else. So when we're talking about the non-Christian world, we're referring to the new world. Um, so Spain, or I'm sorry, Portugal gets Brazil and Spain gets everything else. The goal that the Catholic Church at least says it has is to save these people from their own heathenism as if they need saving. Because again, they have preconceived notions and stereotypes of Native Americans in their culture, and they see them as being lower. And so they have to bring themselves up to European or the European standard of civilization. And the first way to do that is by conversion. So if you can convert to Catholicism, part of this bruteness about you will soften or go away. And so he feels, or I would say Pope Alexander at least believes that through, uh, through conversion, you can grant people civilization. You can grant them a level of uh, civility. Okay. So one way or the way that Spain plans on colonizing the New World is through the encomienda system. So the encomienda system, there is a plan um, for how things are supposed to happen. And then there is the very bleak reality of how things actually happen. So the plan was for Spanish settlers to protect, care for, and let's not forget, Christianized Native Americans. Um, and the Native Americans were supposed to work a portion of their time 
for the Spanish settlers. That's the plan, that we will provide protection for you if you work for us. But the reality is that the Spanish settlers would enslave Native Americans by forcing long hours of labor. They did not pay them. They really did not feed them and they would seize their lands, aka steal the land right from under them. And Native Americans, again, at least in part due to lack of exposure to disease, they will die from disease because they have not built up the immunity. They don't have the same uh, technology as far as weaponry to be able to defend themselves against Europeans. And so they will die from disease. They'll die from harsh living and work uh, conditions and the population will uh, begin to dwindle. So the encomienda system ends after a clergy member uh, protests and Native Americans will revolt. Um, however, it's replaced with the repartimento system um, and it's it, the abuses will continue. So this is where we get to Bartolome de las Casas. So your one of your readings for this week comes from a very brief account of the destruction of the Indies. And so it's in your Voices of Freedom book. It's number three in chapter one. Um, in this, de las Casas, well, I'll give a little background. Bartolome de las Casas is a Dominican priest. And so he is sent to the New World to convert Native Americans. And while he is there, he sees a number of abuses that Native Americans suffer at the hands of the Spanish. And so he ends up writing um, something titled A Very Brief Account of the Destruction of the Indies. Um, and you guys will read that. And I want you to read it in its entirety. It's just an excerpt and it's not very long, but you will definitely, um, I want you to read it, even if you have to read it a few times. What is his main point and what evidence does he give to back up this main point? So what is, uh, Bartolome de las Casas' main point, and what examples does he give to back up or to support, uh, his point? Okay. So please read that. Um, and if you have any questions, I'm available. I can Zoom you or whatever. But back to the lecture. Now, we've talked a bit about the Spanish and your book will talk way more about the Spanish. However, the Spanish are the first. They are there to get gold because whenever they go and set up a society, it's not just them. It's the mother country that's funding them. So whenever they get gold and wealth, they export it back to the mother country. So Spain is becoming incredibly wealthy and other European nations are seeing this and they want their piece of the colonization pie. However, they don't want to necessarily do it in the same way that the Spanish do. The Spanish are incredibly cruel and how they force labor. They are incredibly cruel with the working conditions and the enslavement. Um, and so they end up getting something that we refer to in history as the black legends. They have this black legend that will hang over their head. The black legend of the Spanish um, is a term that refers to the inhumane and incredibly cruel punishment that Native Americans will get uh, from the Spanish. It's called the black legend. So now that Spain has made a lot of money, other countries want a piece of the colonization pie. However, they want the wealth without the bad reputation. So in comes France. France is Spain's first major European uh, rival in colonization. And of course, their aim is to find gold and wealth and glory because that is the aim really of all of them. Um, and so uh, in New France, or the French rather, will establish settlements in the 17th century. So where is New France? New France was along the St. Lawrence and Mississippi and Ohio rivers. And these uh, developments or these settle uh, settlements rather were largely men up to 80% 
men. And that's just not how procreation works. You need a more balanced male to female ratio in order for a lot of these settlements to last. And that's something that we'll really discuss when we talk about the beginnings of English America, is that a lot of these explorers on their boats, they fill the boats with men. And when you're trying to have a settlement, you can't just have men because, again, that's just not how procreation works, right? So France is very different in its relations between uh, or with indigenous people. They are way more humane. They don't appropriate large amounts of Native American land, and they don't force them to labor either. Um, and so also another thing, they're not trying to civilize or uh, convert them. They're not interested in making them subjects necessarily of the crown. And so they have a greater level of of religious tolerance. Um, the French are not the only ones to be like that. We'll also discuss, or we also discuss the Dutch in this chapter. In 1609, Henry Hudson uh, will sail into New York looking for a Northwest Passage. And he's like, yeah, yeah. He sails into New York looking for um, a Northwest Passage, and he will claim the area that is now New York for the Netherlands. And so the area that is now um, present day New York belong to, no, that is, in, that sorry, eh, not belong to, was claimed for the Netherlands. And so that area will be known as New Netherlands. And yes, the Hudson River is named after Henry Hudson um, when he sailed into New York, just in case you were wondering. So life in New Netherlands was different from any other really European settlement of the time. So while New Netherlands is not governed democratically, again, they are not governed democratically. However, there is a bit more freedom in New Netherlands. So what are some examples of these freedoms? So for one, they have freedom of the press and freedom of religion. That's pretty significant. This is what, like 160, 70 odd years before our constitution is even written. And remember, when our constitution was written, freedom of the press, freedom of religion, none of that was even in that. We had to create amendments to add that stuff in there. So to say in the 1600s, you have a society that is giving people freedom of the press and freedom of religion is pretty progressive considering the time. Right. Also, they don't have plantation slavery. There is slavery. Slaves have a few rights, uh, but it's not yet plantation slavery. Also, another thing, and I want you guys to really remember this. So please take note of this. Um, if you have to pause me to prepare to write some notes, pause me if you have to, because again, I won't know. So one thing that I find really interesting is that in New Netherlands, married women had a separate legal identity. So why is this important? Typically, when women got married, not only did you move in, of course, with this man, you take his name um, and your identity kind of falls under his. You lose part of that legal identity. So let's say as a woman, you needed to go to court. Um, if you lived in an area where your legal separate identity was not recognized, your husband would have to go to court on behalf of you because legally you don't have any standing, you don't have any rights. Your husband would have to do it for you. Um, however, in New Netherlands, married women, even or rather even after women got married, they were still able to bring suits in court. They were still able to borrow money if necessary. They were able to own property. And all of that is because marriage did not uh, take away or at least add to a denial of their legal identity. So that's very important um, because a lot of the times once women got married, it was up to their husbands to really decide their futures, at least legally, right? Um, the goal of New Netherlands was not conquest, it was really more or less to develop trade. So because they're not trying to conquer, they're not going to force Native Americans to labor, uh, they're going to be more humane because they need them. Um, 
So again, um, another little thing that I have here that's important to remember is that in New Netherlands, they didn't settle or most of the time, they wouldn't settle in an area without purchasing um, or at least negotiating a price um, in order to be in that area because their goal is not to conquer. Their goal was to trade. Also, it's probably because of that, uh, or at least due in part of that, the New Netherlands doesn't last very long and it's essentially like conquered. I don't know if that's the appropriate word, but conquered by the English. Okay. So in review of this first chapter, we talked about the Spanish. The Spanish are looking for wealth. They're looking for gold. They're looking for glory. And so when they get to the new world, AKA uh, North, Central, and South America, especially Central and South America, because again, we speak the language of our colonizers. When they get there, they appropriate large amounts of Native American land and they force them um, to work in very inhumane working conditions. So mines, um, I want to make sure I get this to you guys. Mines are underground. So you're underground. The further underground you go, sometimes you won't have the best energy supply or I'm not, not energy. I'm sorry. Uh, oxygen supply. Also, when you're digging and you're going underground or going under a mountain or going under any huge rock, it's not stable. So cave-ins are possible. So it's very, you know, inhumane. There's a lot of disease. And so a huge amount of the Native American population population will die from war, from enslavement, and from disease. And all of this is because Spain wants wealth, gold, and glory. Also, when you take away someone's culture, you lose a bit of yourself. You lose a bit of that story that you tell about yourself. Um, you lose a bit of your of your history. And so when we talk about the, the Spanish colonizing um, South America and Central America, it's not just about the physical death, even though that certainly is enough. Um, but it's not just about the physical death. It's also about the cultural death of having your culture taken away from you, of having your language erased, of having your religion erased. All all of these things, language, religion, they play huge parts in determining your identity, who you are. And so part of this is not just a physical death. It is also a cultural death. Because once these people die, their stories, the traditions, the language, all of these things also die. And so it's also important to remember that and what that does to a society psychologically, emotionally, um, what it does or what it could possibly do um, socially and economically, right? So it's always important to look at these things, even though in this chapter, I largely gave you facts. I also want to look at this from the perspective of not just the conquerors, look at it from the perspective of those who are conquered, because it's these people and these stories that need to be told, which is why it's so important that you read, um, a very brief account um, on the destruction of the Indies by Bartolome de las Casas because it does give um, an account of what exactly happens to Native Americans, the brutality that they are forced to endure, right? So think about these things. Think about the fact that it's not just a physical genocide, it's a cultural genocide as well. Um, again, if you have any questions, send me an email. If you'd like to do office hours, I have Zoom, and so I can send you a Zoom link. Um, but if you have any questions whatsoever, send me an email, and uh, I will see you guys next week with chapter two, which is the beginnings of English America. So that should be really interesting. All right, I will see you guys on the flip. See you later, deuces.